Hello, welcome. I'm Susan Thornton Hobby. I'm a board member of Hoco Polizzo, and I'm so happy to welcome you tonight to the 10th annual Lucille Clifton reading. We took our literature online tonight to keep us all safe in our digital bubbles, but also to bring us together. Our former artistic advisor, a frequent reader at events, and Hoco Polizzo's longtime friend, Lucille Clifton wrote poems that won lots of awards, but more important, her poems move people. The family of Lucille Clifton, her daughters, Sydney, Jillian, and Alexia, and her son, Graham, send their best wishes and their welcome. They also wanted to remind all of us of the close and beautiful friendship that Lucille had with Ellen Kennedy, our founder and longtime director. I read a lot of Lucille's poetry and the lines that have been coming to me over the past six months are from the poem that you saw at the beginning of the program. Come celebrate with me that every day something has tried to kill me and has failed. Let's all celebrate that we're here, that nothing has killed us today, and that we're ready to be moved by the poetry of Joseph Ross. You saw a photo of the house in Baltimore where Lucille Clifton raised six of her children, and then her present day children are on the right, her surviving children. Um, the family has bought the house and is turning it into a writer's retreat uh, for events, and I'm so excited about that project. So let's all celebrate we're here, and we're ready to be moved by the poetry of Joseph Ross. This performance is supported in part by the Maryland State Arts Council and the Howard County Arts Council. You can visit them at msac.org and hocoarts.org. You can help support programs like this by offering a donation. Before we get to the poems, we need to meet someone else. Um, poet E. Ethelbert Miller will int introduce Joseph Ross, our featured poet for tonight. Many times, Ethelbert has stood at our podiums. He is a longtime friend of Hoco Polizzo a brilliant innovator, and a vital connector in the literary world. He has served as Hoco Polizzo's writer in residence and a frequent host for our talk show. A literary activist and the author of two memoirs and several poetry collections, Ethelbert hosts the WPFW morning radio show On the Margin and hosts and produces The Scholars on UDC TV. Miller's latest book, If God Invented Baseball, was awarded the 2019 Literary Award for Poetry by the American Library Association's Black Caucus. Please prepare yourself for E. Ethelbert Miller. What we ask of Jesus is what we ask of Joseph. Is his reputation true? I feel honored and to some degree blessed to introduce Joseph Ross. When I think of this man, I think of friendship and brotherhood, something at times more eloquent and more meaningful than poetry. To be presented with his books of poetry is to participate in the breaking of bread. Reading Ross comes with rituals and remembering. The breaking of bread is not silent. It echoes this man's genius. Joseph Ross is choir as well as congregation. His poetry is not the poetry of witness, but instead the poetry of understanding and compassion. It is a way of listening to history's heartbeat. At times, Ross becomes a photographer, not simply documenting the civil rights movement, but interpreting it and offering a deeper meaning. Ross takes us inside a photograph and reemerges with a poem, something cutting, yet fragile and still a form of tenderness that guides one beyond revision. It is the detail within the frame and captured in a stanza that amazes me. When Ross writes about Rosa Parks, he directs the ear and eye to the purse in her lap. Like Whitman, the poetry of Ross contains multitudes, including Matthew Shepard, Tommy Smith, 
John Carlos, John Coltrane, Henry Otana, Addie Mae Collins, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson, Cynthia Wesley, Basquiat, and Nelson Mandela. In his books, Gospel of Dust and Ache, Joseph Roth reminds us that some wounds cannot be washed clean. And so he writes, if Mamie Till was the mother of God, every coffin lid would be glass. So even God could see how baptisms are done in Mississippi. The poetry of Joseph Ross is what comes after Confederate monuments have been taken down. One finds throughout his work a reference to breath and breathing. We are instructed to wade in the water whenever we feel there's trouble in the air. Which brings us to Martin Luther King Jr. The man, the myth, the martyr. Before Ross raises King, he writes about the Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial. If the body of God could live in stone, it would look like this preacher whose gaze dares us to stand upright and breathe in this bleeding land. Yes, our nation is bleeding but there is a bomb in Gilead. Sometimes I feel discouraged and think my work's in vain, but then the Holy Spirit revives my soul again. Oh, there is a bomb in Gilead to make the wounded whole. So today we are raising King with a man who is the 23rd poet in residence for the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society, a man who is a teacher and student at Gonzaga High School in D.C. I wrote a blurb for Raising King. Do I dare quote myself? Yes, I quote myself. And here's an excerpt of my words. Ross has given us words that capture the thunder and sounds of protest. Raising King prepares us for the storm that will baptize us into beauty. This is so needed. After all the recent ugliness, someone please bless our awakening. Joseph Ross is the poet who stands up like Willie Lewis in a Mississippi courtroom. Joseph Ross writes while surrounded by the light that came to Lucille Clifton. If this man also has a six finger like Lucille, I know it points towards God. In much the same way, King pointed us in the direction of the dream. To raise King is to not only read, but to dream again. Memory cannot be murdered. All things dare. Do not disappear. And here is Joseph Ross. Thank you for joining us tonight for this 2020 Lucille Clifton reading. It's a real honor for me to be here. Lucille Clifton had a deep impact on my writing and on my teaching. Teach her every year in American literature. She constantly turns students' hearts uh, in the right way. I also know many poets who consider her a real mentor, an ancestor, uh, so any reading named for her, uh, I'm grateful to be part of. I'm also grateful to the Hoko Polizzo, the Howard County Poetry and Literature Society, for all the good work that they do throughout the year over many years. Uh, I've had the privilege to work with them on a number of occasions, and they are really such a thoughtful uh, insightful arts organization. I'm grateful to them for inviting me, especially for this reading because it is the first reading uh, from a new book, Raising King. As we record this reading tonight, America nears 200,000 deaths from COVID-19, and the world nears a million deaths from this virus. So I want to dedicate this reading to all those who have lost someone 
we are living in a real season of loss. Loved ones, family members, friends, co-workers, we're all in this together. And as Lucille Clifton um, would do, she knew loss. She knew suffering, especially suffering through illness. And she wrote about it honestly and beautifully. Well, this new book, Raising King, it invites you to walk with Dr. King from Montgomery to Memphis. The book is divided into three sections with poems in each section reflecting on words from three of his books. First, Stride Toward Freedom is all about Montgomery. Then Why We Can't Wait is all about the violence of 1963. And finally, Where Do We Go From Here? Chaos or Community? Dr. King writes in the last year of his life. And each section ends with a poem in the voice of Coretta Scott King. Dr. King could not have given the life he did without her. So let us begin. Martin Luther King Jr. Prologue. One. In the beginning was a boat, swollen with humans history would call slaves. The men who loved these boats thought they knew Jesus. They prayed Jesus. They ate Jesus. Their boat cut the waters like a whip, leaving a weeping scent in its churning wake. The moon lit the waters around the boat, but the moon did not light the boat. The boat worked through the waters in the dark. Now the boat is dust. The whip survives. Two. A man came who was not a slave. He was not the moon, its light, or the water. Like the boats before him, he too cut the water, but he was not the whip. He had bones the whip could not reach, but he was not the bones. He had light to cut the darkness, but he was not the light. He met the darkness when the whip became a bullet. The man stood and the bullet came. His bones are dust. The man survives. In Montgomery, Dr. King said this, it was Jesus of Nazareth that stirred the Negroes. Christology. The white people often say I'm stirring people up, causing a ruckus where there was no ruckus before I came. It might seem that way to them because they have never been at a Negro family's dinner table. They've never tasted the angry exhaustion that lives on this side of town. They've never sat in Reverend Abernathy's church. They've never heard him preach the Jesus he knows, the leper touching Jesus, the cheek turning Jesus, the enemy loving Jesus. That's the ruckus. It's a holy ruckus. And Jesus brought it, not me. Tired feet for tired souls. These feet slip between sheets to a morning floor. Before coffee and language, they know the air. They welcome sock and shoe. Laces hold them ready for the work of the day, of being beneath. They create the straight way of sidewalk, the step of curb, the caution of crosswalk, the patience of standing still. When heel and arch and toe press leather to concrete, they scuff the smile of protest, the unmistakable joy of defiance. About the first day of the bus, bus boycott, Dr. King wrote, the day of days, December 5th. You plan and you call and organize and prepare for every eventuality, but you never know what will come. My wife and I woke earlier than usual, and I was afraid. I was still saying, if we could get 60%, I would be satisfied. In my mind, buses rolled by with black people atop the bus and hanging from windows, dragging their feet. White men and women filled the bus laughing, doubled over laughing. What was I thinking would happen? I was in the kitchen, whispering over a cup of coffee when I heard Coretta cry, Martin, Martin, come quickly. I stopped praying and ran into the living room, breathing like an army. A slowly moving bus rolled down our street like a hearse, the casket still years away. 
Coretta sang into my faithlessness, Darling, it's empty. I could hardly believe it. Sometimes believing and knowing have to happen at the same time. The police in Montgomery tried, of course, every way to stop the bus boycott, arresting people for all kinds of, or trying to arrest people for all kinds of crazy things. They succeeded in making one arrest, Dr. King writes, in Stride Toward Freedom. One arrest. Home from college for Christmas break, he saw an elderly woman on the corner, hesitant to step into the street, unsure of the concrete, the cars, the color of safety constantly changed. She leaned like one who needed to cross. She looked in more directions than there were. He walked up behind her, spoke to her. She took his arm like the prophet's staff it was, raised her eyes and stepped into the street, her brown-heeled shoe greeting the concrete with a firmness of its own making. She did not look down. She thanked him at the opposite curb. They smiled until the police walked up. He urged her to go on. She refused. The police said words they would not say to their grandmothers. She told them she'd been scared to cross, but this young man, so they arrested him for intimidating passengers. She recorded his face in her mind and kept it there for years after, an icon, almost a savior. Mass meetings. These meetings were our lungs. Here we breathed. We needed to christen an organization, a leader. I didn't know these people. Abernathy was my only friend. We baptized ourselves the Montgomery Improvement Association, a name as good as any other, better than one that sounded too much like their white citizen councils. They were named for terror. We were named for resurrection. Then it was me. Put the new guy out there. He hasn't been beaten by them yet. He has a degree of distance that will throw them for a bit. My only real qualification? I didn't yet know the density of the human fist. Dr. King writes in Stride Toward Freedom, nonviolent resistance was one of the most potent weapons available to oppressed people in their quest for social justice. Be broken. When the hand scoops salt water and pours it over the head, it is a baptism in walking forward, an admission that the eyes are in the front of the human head. They see in one direction. They see a lunch counter become an altar. Food and hatred can both be thrown at people. Both feed the one who throws them. The blood streaming from a human head consecrates the plates and coffee cups onto which it spills, but the human head needs no consecration. Its sanctity is proven by the fact that it can bleed. Still in Montgomery, Dr. King often received phone calls like this one. He writes, the nonviolent resistor not only refuses to shoot his opponent, but he also refuses to hate him. Inheritance. That angry voice on the phone was once someone's dearest baby. A promising little boy who said, listen, N-word, we've taken all we want from you. Before next week, you'll be sorry you ever came to Montgomery. This beautiful little boy, smiling, giggling, today sings out a hatred he has learned, a song his country handed him. His hatred and fear are not really his. He inherited them. He took them into himself without knowing how gruesome they would taste, how they would sicken him too. I cannot hate him for inheriting this. I will not destroy him just because someone taught him to destroy me. In Stride Toward Freedom, still in, Birmingham, uh, in uh, Montgomery, Dr. King writes, after putting the baby to bed, Coretta and Mrs. Williams went to the living room 
About 9.30, they heard a noise in front that sounded as though someone had thrown a, thrown a brick. In a matter of seconds, an explosion rocked the house. A bomb had gone off on the porch. Bomb. War is like this. Two women, a baby, a man gone, a man lost. I was lost like this. A baby in the back bedroom, a wife shaking, unable to be still, a friend calm but about to break, a crowd gathered. I ran home to see what was left of me. The crowd was angry. I wanted their anger to love my own. But my wife's shaking stopped, keeping me from breaking, keeping me from becoming the bomb I feared. And there were many nights like this. Coretta had already fallen asleep, and just as I was about to doze off, the telephone rang. An angry voice said, listen, N-word, I'd heard it before. In this state of exhaustion, when my courage had all but gone, I decided to take my problem to God. With my head in my hands, I spoke. I have nothing left. Midnight. I have always been here in this midnight kitchen in this midnight city, in this midnight life. I have always known this is when the strength comes in this midnight country, in my midnight throat, from this midnight God. Smoldering. The language spoken by an unexploded bomb is the language of possibility. It is a terror tongue. It sounds like an infant still forever. It echoes still like a woman silent on the floor of her own home. It is where they wait for father and husband. Home is where the heart breaks into pieces the size of privilege. Is it my good luck that 12 sticks of dynamite did not sing the chorus they were taught? Is it my good fortune that a fuse doesn't always complete its work? Here is America's truth. This bomb was not the only thing smoldering in my home. And Coretta Scott King, Montgomery. If there is sheet music for this city, I have never seen its likes before. The melody keeps changing. Just as I start to sing one line, I see the notes at the end of the line dodging and ducking in every direction. Quarter notes dart from their place on the staff and try to stand up taller to puff out their chests like whole notes, keeping the voice alive longer. I can sing almost anything, but this shape-shifting opera of shoes makes it hard to breathe. It keeps moving from solo to choral piece. I know there are other voices, and I know their timber is all shoe and sweat, but I fear they will leave me bare. At the beginning of uh, Why We Can't Wait, about the violence of 1963, Dr. King describes um, a boy in Harlem and a girl in Birmingham. 1963, one. A boy sits on his stoop. The house leans hopeless as he is. The rats love him and his family. They know him. He has nowhere to go. He has nowhere to be. He dreams of nowhere. When he wakes after dreams of nowhere, he goes nowhere. His school forgets him. He forgets him. His parents work, but their exhaustion forgets him too. Is he a dream? Has his country deferred him? Can nowhere explode? Two, a girl sits on her stoop, the wood of her home older than her grandmother, but not as sturdy. The field where her parents work is thirsty as she is, but not as angry. She sits and remembers school, but learns now in a field because debts are loud. They shout more fury than books. Three, this is the year young people will sing fury in a melody that hurts in a rhythm that burns, a flame so hot, 
fire hoses shove these singers against walls, but those hoses and their water, their judges, their county clerks, their governor and their country cannot extinguish anything. Below the surface. If you cut human skin with a sharp enough blade, the very second you slice into it, blood fills the space the blade created. The red life oozes forth, a rhythm of replacement, a falsehood. The split skin only looks red. This is blood. This is broken skin. This is America's weeping. Human blood bubbling forth from vein onto skin and streaking down the arm or leg or forehead. It becomes a map documenting precisely where the country refuses to go. The only power. When a person accepts undeserved suffering, a spark bursts into air. It coughs, gasps, and breathes. It begins its burning life. When a person accepts undeserved suffering, the privilege of the mighty trembles before the only power it does not have, the willingness to suffer. Dr. King wrote in Why We Can't Wait, if you had visited Birmingham before the 3rd of April in the 100th year anniversary of the Negro's emancipation, you might have come to a startling conclusion. Startling. Nothing changed. The ink on Lincoln's proclamation was still wet. It waited like a tear. It was not dry. It sat on the paper for a century. What rain lasts a century? What blood takes more than a hundred years to dry? This waiting has stood up slowly, but it stands now. It looks you in the eye and spits the word today. One of a man, Dr. King, deeply admired Reverend Fred Shuttlesworth was really the heart behind all of the Birmingham protests, uh, both uh, inspiring them and working out their practicalities. This is, there is one. Often behind a great moment is one, in this case, man. One man who could see the sky before it could be pierced. One man who could imagine a city unlike the one where he lived a city where skin, black as a white man's fear, could sing a melody so haunting, even the ghosts would run scared for their lives. This man could hear the song's conclusion while singing its opening lines. He could anticipate where he would need to breathe so he would have enough air for the song that rang like jail. He became a whole note, singing the melody of steel, the harmony of cell doors the world thought were slamming shut. He knew better. Their metal doors only seemed to close. These jail cells were filled with fire, and fire is always free. We made it clear, he would write in Why We Can't Wait, we would not send anyone out to demonstrate who had not convinced himself and us that he could accept and endure violence without retaliating. It takes time. It takes time to learn this. It must be proven in the light of day that you will look him in the hand and love his fist to death. Dr. King's closest friend, uh, through much of his public life was certainly Ralph Abernathy, uh, who was, really was with him from Montgomery to Memphis. When they were going to get arrested on Good Friday, meant they wouldn't be in church on Easter Sunday. Dr. King turned to Abernathy and said, I know you want to be in your pulpit on Easter Sunday, Ralph, but I'm asking you to go with me. Martin King speaks of Ralph Abernathy. I knew what he would say before I asked him, but asking is my religion. 
He shook his head and smiled like he always does. He spoke in the language of brother, in the dialect of love. He knew the buoyancy of a decision made. He knew I did too. Once you say it, the doing is easier. Once you do it, your body floats into prayer. In Why We Can't Wait, and in the letter from Birmingham Jail, which is in that book, Dr. King writes, in any nonviolent campaign, there are four basic steps, collection of the facts to determine whether injustice exists, negotiation, self-purification, and direct action. We have gone through all these steps in Birmingham. Even though we must know what we do, we must think through the consequences of what they do to us, of what we might do to them. We must be as close to pure as humans come. We must walk straight into their arms. Dr. King all, uh, often was critiqued for breaking laws, civil disobedience, and he made the distinction between just laws and unjust laws. A legal theory. Here is a legal theory most bar associations do not know. This context, this landscape. The law lives in a world with people, and people use stones against one another. So laws keep us from our animal selves. But laws can also urge us deeper into our animal selves. We cling to anything that uplifts the real. We protest all that degrades. This law keeps us human. As Dr. King would often say the heroes in Birmingham were children. Uh, Jim Bevel had the inspiration of setting a D-Day when the students would go to jail in historic numbers. There were 2,500 demonstrators in jail at one time. In dresses and bows. In dresses and bows, in jeans and t-shirts, in crisp church shirts and skinny black ties, with songs and laughter, with swagger and sweat, for honor and for fun, for a future they wanted, for a present they refused. The heart of the Birmingham protests, a crucifixion. One, a crucifixion does not always require a cross. It sometimes takes the shape of a sidewalk, a cop, a nightstick raised, blooming with nails. A crucifixion does not need Roman soldiers. It sometimes only needs a fearful uniformed man whose fear poses as anger, a fear he doesn't even know he has. Two, when a police dog bares its teeth and lunges, it is best to live in another country, in another time. When that dog's collar barely controls him, when its handler smiles at you, terrified, you see how many songs are required. Three, when a high-pressure hose hits you from a few yards away, bones fail. You can't hear them, but you feel them, and you collapse in a bloodless defeat, but not a defeat, because fear is not the only terrible force. Following a KKK rally uh, on the outskirts of Birmingham, the home of Dr. King's brother, Reverend A.D. King, was bombed. My brother's keeper. I am, of course, my brother's keeper. I have always been my brother's keeper. We have always been our brother's keepers. The, his home is our home. The bomb on his porch is the bomb on our porch. The men who leave the bomb in the darkness, they are ours too. The height of A. Philip Randolph, whose idea it was for the March on Washington. Sometimes a tall man has the answer. This man has worked on enough trains to know the meaning of departure, the taste of arrival. He stands closer to God than most of us. 
He hears the, cr- the clouds whisper what can only be heard from a height. March. On September 16th, uh, on September 15th, 1963, the moon over Birmingham, Alabama was a waning crescent. Only 6% was visible. And this was the day of the uh, bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church. And two, two black boys also were killed that same day later in the day. So for Addie Mae Collins, Cynthia Wesley, Denise McNair, Carol Robertson for Johnny Robinson and Virgil Ware. You were a waning crescent, the barest of slivers in the darkest night Alabama knows. You were a trace of light these children could not see. They each slept under your curving back, unaware of the tides to come. You were a silent wound in the stabbed sky. You said nothing. You should have been a warning to us all on such a lightless night as 1963. The bomber, the cop, the boy, the bricks, the bullets, they did not ask for your light. They did not need your protection, but we do. We need to see. We need to be the waning, the waxing, and the, and the warning. And for Virgil Ware, uh, who was shot on his bicycle with his brother by another boy, a white boy on a motorcycle. Our Lady of Sorrows comes to Birmingham, too, for Virgil Ware. A boy on his bike should be out of bounds, dreaming of his paper route, admiring his big brother, smiling till his cheek turns. His mother waited for him, doted on him, treated him like the little one he was. This moment, a wound riding by on a motorbike would break her too. She would stand beside this cross and stare at what their fear does. She would breathe without wanting to. She would open her arms to receive the altar of his limp body. She would raise him to the God who did not protect him. She would hiss through her bruised teeth. This is my body given up for you. Dr. King writes in Why We Can't Wait, the assassination of President Kennedy killed not only a man, but a complex of illusions. This November, I wish I could believe in fairy tales, in Santa Claus, in a tooth fairy, a rabbit heralding Easter. But this November wind unmasks everything. This is our country, this assassin's republic this shame that shoots from an empty warehouse window, this spitting land with more than enough bullets for us all. Coretta Scott King, 1963. We have daughters now, girl humans in this year of girls Girls in church basements wandering the streets at night, wondering why their childhoods were stolen by their country. This is also the year of learning, a civics lesson I thought I already knew. That black bodies mean nothing. That black bodies mean everything. That black bodies still do not count in America. I thought I knew this. I must keep forgetting since America feels the need to keep teaching me this in years, in numbers, in bodies, in daughters, in girls. And in the last years, last year of his life, he writes, uh, where do we go from here, chaos or community? And one of the incidents he remembers is James Meredith and his march across fear, march against fear, walking across Mississippi, who was shot in the back. These colors. James was willing to walk alone, but no one with skin the color of wood should walk alone in Mississippi. This is a land of men the color of cowardice. This is a land of guns the color of shadows. These colors bloom in Mississippi. These colors are not strong enough to walk alone. These colors look for a man's back.
Dr. King writes in Where Do We Go From Here? What is needed is a realization that power without love is reckless and abusive, and that love without power is sentimental and anemic. Love and power. Love gets on its knees and washes its friend's feet. Power pushes the other aside. Love listens without speaking back. Power insists on itself. Power is fist and voice, boot and gun. Love gazes, waits, continues, shares. Love asks, power orders. Joined, love and power consecrate the only communion. They become bread and wine, brick and stone, with which we build and feed the world house. Thunder. There is something about thunder. Why it frightens children. Why it makes grown men and women look up to the sky, squinting, wondering what tempest is to come. Discontent is a, dung, is a dungeon, a jail cell below the ground. No one stays there. We rise through anger and protest to become a rumbling. We run to hills from which we can see the land around us. This is our thunder. We are the storm. Dr. King writes of what he called the three triplets, racism, materialism, and militarism. The giant triplets. One. There are diseases that kill. They do not live in our DNA. They are not the result of a crippled gene. These toxins, toxins come from outside us. They exist. They make their way in. We sometimes act like we don't see them. That is one of their symptoms. Two. Skin and color, seeing and not seeing. This skin disease has roots in the tribe. Once we might have needed to fear those who did not look like us. Today, it is a blindness we cannot see. Today, we've built countries on this fear. We breathe it in from just after birth. It takes humility to name it and push it away. Three, it is as simple as this. Do you think there is enough? Or do you think there is not enough? Our answer creates our creed. It is as simple as this. Four, it is not just a willingness to kill. It is the willingness to build a kingdom of killing to not feed your children because a faster missile is delicious, to not care for your elder because we are grateful to a more powerful Humvee. This is what kills, creating weapons in every part of the land, linking jobs to death so no one will say no. Five, these triplets should have been killed at birth, but they weren't. They were allowed to live. Now they ravage the house. Dr. King uh, spent his last night in Memphis, Tennessee. He'd been there twice supporting the sanitation workers who worked in horrible conditions. And he gave a speech on his last night at Mason Temple that sounded like he knew. The mountaintop. I've been to the mountaintop and I've seen the promised land. I might not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promised land. An exhaustion rests on my skin like sweat. Tonight, I am afire with this truth. I and we are one. Whether I see certain victory does not matter anymore. Whether my children see it is all that matters. That the children of Memphis see it is enough. Tonight I am alive with this comfort. I can let it all go. The worst fear will eventually come true. I will not know its day and time until it's here. Even then, I might not know it. Tonight I am released with this glory. My own eyes have seen it. Tonight I am at peace with this terror. Coretta Scott King, Funeral. 
What do you tell your children about their father stone still in a casket before them? That a bad man in Memphis did this and so, that our country did this and so, these little children need to live with the man who did this. These little children need to live with the country that did this. What do you tell your children? Martin Luther King, Epilogue. One. When his body is carried through the streets in a wooden wagon older than his father, when his children look on his lifeless skin with curious grief, when his widow's face waits in stillness, knowing every day from now on can be a bullet. Two, like the many who killed him, he too knew Jesus, but his life prepared his hands for the silk of wood. He readied his palm for the kiss of nails. He knew more than knowing can say. He bled more than blood. Three, most days, memory is the enemy, but no one wants a memory. We want the touch, the real man. One day, memory is all that remains. We will all burn down to its truth. Four, he knew memory wedded to time makes possible. He knew memory, loved into the future, can crush a bullet into sand. He knew this was not hope or magic. He knew memory burned into tomorrow is not a certainty. Every moment waits to be used, and using time carefully is our why. Using time with love is our revolution. This is how we raise him. This is how we rise. Joe, <laughs> wow, your words are, are smoldering in me. Um, fear is not the only terrible force is one of my favorite lines. Um, so thank you. Thank you. Um, one of the poems from Raising King uh, called Late appeared in last month's uh, New York Times Magazine. Congratulations. Um, Hoko Pulitzer is honored that tonight was the debut reading of this collection. Um, First, I want to do a quick thank you before we get to some questions. Um, so we'd like to thank Joseph, of course, um, and Ethelbert, and our producer today, who's the poet and videographer, Alan King, as well as Hoka Polizzo's staff, Pamela Simonson and Kathy Stowe, and as well as our board, a working board. Um, Lucille always asks people to hold hands at the end of her classes. And while we can't physically do that, I'm going to invoke that spirit. If you've enjoyed tonight's poetry and feeling like celebrating that nothing has killed you yet, think about holding the hand of someone you love um, tonight. Uh, so at Hoka Pulitzo, we believe that words and stories can change the world, uh, but world changing isn't free. Check the chat for a link to contribute. And while you're in the chat window, please feel free to type up any questions you have for Joe. Um, Facebook viewers can type the questions in the comment section. We'll ask Joe for you. Um, I'm going to start off with one uh, really quickly. Um, so both your writing and Dr. King's writing is suffused with Christianity, which really offers a shorthand um, and confers a kind of generosity and love to both of your writings. Could you talk about using that kind of language? Mm. Yeah, well, it's cer it certainly is um, permeates everything in Dr. King's writing. Uh, he was a deeply committed Christian man, um, and and trained academically in the you know what what I think kind of came to be known as the social gospel. Uh, uh, this I this this vision of Christianity that places social justice at the center. Um, it's probably a minor, but probably has always been kind of a minority. A thread within Christian within the Christian churches, um, you know. I too, I was raised Catholic. Uh, I was raised with those images: the image of Mary at the foot of the cross, like Our Lady of Sorrows, the and and especially the images of ritual, of bread and cup, um, and and I just I think I and and I a lot of people I think we've we have just found those images to be so powerful 
sometimes taken away from us with sentimentality or, you know, locked behind a doctrine that my mind can't accept, you know, and I, I often say to students, it's hard to believe in a God who would um, give me a mind to ask questions and then forbid me to ask them. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I, you know, it's just a, it has been a deep part of my life. Um, and so trying to fuse some of mine with Dr. King seemed to be the best way to find language that was surprising, which I think is always a mm -hmm. kind of my, that's the note I listen for uh, in a poem. It does the language surprise me uh, or maybe even language that's beautiful. Um, but I, yeah, I, I mean, it certainly is all through Dr. King's writing. It's often in mine. Uh, and uh, I think it, I, I hope it reaches people. I think it, it, it touches some things in us that are deeply human. Um, so you're getting lots and lots of um, kudos in the chat. Powerful, beautiful, oh. wow, which is great. Haunting okay. and beautiful and powerful, which all of which I agree with. Um, Thank you. Um, so I have a question from Laura Yu. Um, she asked, can you talk about the process of putting this collection together, which is a great question. Um, you did so much reading and yeah. research. Yeah, I feel like, I don't think I knew it. I didn't know it at the time, but I think I've been writing this book for uh, more than 20 years, maybe, kind of in my head. I, I began teaching Dr. King's life and work um, back at Notre Dame in um, the late 80s in freshman seminar classes. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I just kind of kept thinking, was always thinking about his life, seeing his life as, in some ways, in my mind, the, the, one of the essential American lives. Um, and so, you know, many years later, after I moved to DC, uh, I was teaching co a composition class at uh, American University and my friend and then a colleague there, Karan Martinez, she knew my uh, interest in Dr. King and, and she said, you know, you should just, you can pick a theme for your comp class. Why don't you just teach it on Dr. King? And I sort of thought, a whole class just on King, like a whole semester, this would be too much. Of course, that was stupid. It wouldn't be <laughs> much at all. Uh, but I, I, I was, I kind of worried about it at the time. So people call, uh, some scholars call uh, three of Dr. King's book, his books, his political autobiographies, Stride Toward Freedom, All About Montgomery, Word, uh, Why We Can't Wait, The Violence of 63, and then Where Do We Go From Here, Chaos or Community, which he writes in the last year of his life. Uh, he is lived under death threats for years by that point. He's, it's post Nobel Peace Prize. So he really, though still a very young man, he sees, he really sees a global vision. Um, so we, I taught those three books throughout the class and the whole time I was teaching them the two, two years, two different spring semesters, um, because that was the semester students could choose their comp class. So I thought, well, then it, I'm not forcing King on people or something, you know, these, these, these kids are choosing it. Um, I just kept thinking, this is, this is a book of poems that poems can respond to these, to these three books. Mm -hmm. um, and so I, I literally took the books that I taught from, which then are, you know, highlighted like crazy and question marks in the margin, <laughs> exclamation points in the margin, all the crazy stuff that teachers do. Um, and I just began to kind of pull different quotes and pull things that I thought were um, were essential to King, but were also a little bit beyond, um, you know, people sometimes recently are complaining, and I think it's legit, about the kind of whitewashing of Dr. King's work, you know, that, um, that everything he was about had to do with holding hands and kind of getting along. Um, and his, his uh, you know, his critique of American culture and of human cultures is much more complex than that. Um, and there is a richness, you know, these ideas about the world house, the beloved community, the American triplets, those are really thoughtful, creative, hard uh, critiques of culture. And um, so I used, wanted to use those things. So it wasn't a kind of a King light kind of book or, a, you know, a diet King. Um, so it came from teaching that class and then eventually seeing there are poems here that, that a book could lay itself out uh, like this. Yeah. So thanks, Laura, you for asking that question. Good question. Yeah. 
Yeah. Russian. Yeah. Um, so the poems in the first section, Stride Toward Freedom, they kind of, they deal with the bus, bus boycott and there's all that walking and meeting. Um, in one of the first poems, you mentioned the word ruckus, the ruckus yeah. the King was stirring up. I think of ruckus in the same thread as John Lewis's John, Good Trouble. Mm -hmm. you know? um, mm -hmm. Maybe you could talk about that tradition of, of holy ruckus and good trouble. Yeah. Yeah, well, it's 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 the tradition that that comes out of a. I think Dr. King really uh, clarified this idea: the the ideas of negative peace and positive peace. Negative peace might look like nobody's killing each other, but there's all kinds of injustice beneath the surface. Uh, mm -hmm. So it is not peace, really. It's just you know, cheap calm, maybe. Uh, and a and a and a positive peace then is is real peace where. The, the work has been done, the confrontations have occurred, uh, and, and the justice has been created. And then it might look, again, like nobody's killing each other, uh, but it's a real peace. It's not the, it's not the, um, the negative peace. And, and I think that Dr. King's idea and John Lewis's idea that he, you know, kind of phrases it so well with that good trouble phrase, um, is the insistence that we not just live in silence in the presence of injustice, that you have to at some point get in the way. You've got to, if, if something is going on that is degrading the human personality, that was Dr. King's um, kind of litmus test for what is an unjust law. It, if something is happening that degrades the human personality, then it has to be confronted. And that's the good trouble. Uh, or, you know, that's, that's, that's the ruckus, the holy ruckus that Dr. King would say, Jesus brought it, not him. Um, because he had seen, or, you know, and been, had been told of, you know, generations of black Montgomery who had, were not acting. They weren't standing up. They weren't doing things. But, but given a little bit of the spark, uh, he constantly praised the ordinary people who were standing up, you know, in numbers and in ways that they had not done before. Um, you know, and there may be, a, you know, a lot of reasons why, you know, things come to be at a certain moment in history. It's usually a dozen things coming together, you know, or more. Um, but that, that tradition in the social justice kind of Christianity that says you don't just sit back when injustice is happening. You've got to stand up in, in some way and do something. And that's the good trouble. That's the, that's the ruckus. And for, unfortunately, it, it sort of takes martyrs uh, along the way. Um, but John Lewis is one, you know, I really do think of King as the martyr that way, but John Lewis is the one that, you know, thankfully we got him, we got him in our lives, in our country here for a long time. Uh, and he was able to really show us and teach us a lot. Very good. Um, so these topics are so dramatic. They're so freighted with disaster and courage. How do you compress that into a small poem without it, Oh, exploding or overflowing. Mm -hmm. hmm. Well, I think sometimes, um, you know, when you're writing about something that's intense, I think one of the cue, one of the imp important cues to take is, um, is restraint, actually. Mm -hmm. You know, um, uh, James Meredith being shot in the back, you know, walking alone, trying to walk across Mississippi, the March Against Fear, that, that does not need any language to hype it. You know, it is, it is brutal and, and disappointing and sad and infuriating enough. So I think you find language then um, that is restrained, that's very moderated uh, and, and try to do it in as few words as possible, as lean as possible. Um, because the, yeah, the, um, and, and I'm, yeah, and, and I, I just think restraint, moderation, those are kind of the keys, I think. Mm -hmm. um, not that you, you know, you don't have to, you're not trying to soften the intensity of the event or, you know, the, the moment you're describing, but it's just letting, letting, the, letting the moment have, kind of emit its own power uh, because the moments that, at least I hope the ones I chose um, are loaded, you know, they, they have enough of their own power. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, so, um, we have a question here. Um, I'm not sure who it's from. Uh, it's a um, it's a more political question. So we'll get back to poetry in a minute. Um, 
It says, given the sad right-wing vision of Catholicism that is present today in American politics, what do you say to your students who want to stand up for a Christian commitment to social justice, especially in regard to the recent, recent uh, Supreme Court of the United States nominee? So I don't know who that's from, but um, we can go with that for a minute. Sure. I mean, it's a great question. Um, and uh, yeah, and I, you know, I teach in a Catholic high school. Uh, I teach in a Jesuit high school which is, you know, within the Catholic tradition, but is probably a tradition, the Jesuits that really are not afraid of questions. Yeah. Uh, so, I, so I think the kinds of, you know, our, our students get pretty well doused, uh, if not immersed, <laughs> if not drowned, you know, they get pretty well doused in, um, in the social justice uh, Christianity. Um, you know, institutions, uh, I guess, you know, a certain point in my life, I, ha I have come to realize that institutions will always disappoint you. They in invariably, you know, at one level or another, they become uh, to be just about their own survival. And their, their mission, the real fire or spark that might have been there at the, at the beginning can often, you know, really come down and not be so visible. Um, and at least, I don't know, you know, that's kind of the way that I view the, 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 the questioner talking about, um, you know, the right-wing bishops, you know, I mean, how can you, or right-wing Catholics, I mean, how, you know, if you can look at President Trump's behavior and say that he is a right to life or a pro-life president, um, you know, you have tortured those words into meaninglessness. You know, uh, you, can't, you can't call yourself pro-life uh, and and, and be okay with children in cages. Um, you know, so it's a, it's, a, it, it's, a, it's a sadly narrow view of Christianity that some institutional churches have. Um, it's a not unpredictable thing that happens, I think, in institutions. And, um, you know, institutions help us for sure, uh, but I think we have to sort of, you know, keep your relationship careful and be wary uh, because you know you you can you can you can lose the pulse and still be still appear to be quite alive and right. it's not it's not much yeah right I hope that helps a little bit that's a great answer that's yeah. a great answer um, so Tara would like to know um, she says your poems that take on another persona and voice are especially powerful can you talk about your process the creative process in bringing that other person to life through your poetry yeah that's a great question. Yeah, it's a good question. It's a, something that many people would say I shouldn't do. Um, many people would say poets should never do. Some people would say that, you know, a non-black poet should not write in the voice of a black preacher. Uh, and I, I can appreciate uh, the, I, that. I, I understand the, the concern. Um, I think you have to know, you know, I think first of all, you have to, you have to respect the voice and, and respect the person's life and know um, know enough about the person that what you write then in his in his voice or in that other person's voice is legitimate is you know accurate to a to a degree or accurate in spirit at least um i think you've got to be careful with it um but i i guess i i found myself thinking i i am just i guess maybe obviously i hope obviously one of those people who thinks that um the world really would be better if more people knew Dr. King's life and work and, and below the surface, uh, you know, below, more than I have a dream, right. um, the world would be better. And so at a certain point, I think I sort of weighed um, in, in writing the book I wanted to read, you know, um, I think the world would be better with Dr. if people knew Dr. King's work, do I write this or do I, you know, uh, a, a, assent to another idea that says I shouldn't write in someone else's voice like this. You know, you, I mean, you, you see the choice I made. I mean, in the, I, you can tell what conclusion I came to. I wrote the book. Um, I guess, I, yeah, I would say, you know, read I, to that person, read the poems and, and I hope that, you know, do they sound true? Um, and I hope that they do. Um, so, I mean, more specific to kind of to Tara's question and, you know, writing about any, any, writing in anyone else's voice, and I've done it in other, you know, settings and other people and other books of poems. Um, I think you have to know the person's life. You've got to respect, you've got, it's got to be a respectful rendering. 
uh, of of how you understand them. Um, you can't. I don't think you should ever take on someone else's unless it you know has some kind of fantasy or something. But you shouldn't take the person's voice into a place that that their that their real life didn't go. Um, those are some of the first things that come to my mind. Anyway, yeah, I think it's it's uh, it's it's territory any writer has to tread sort of carefully. Um, yeah. Right. right. And I was intrigued by um, the, the poems that thinking about the idea of witness, you know, mm -hmm. your witness, your, your poetry of witness has a tradition of, you know, showing things that most people don't see and, and bringing people's attention to them. But poetry of witness through persona poems have a different perspective. I, I just think it's a fascinating idea. Thank you. I, I mean, I, I think that it, it has the potential, and I hope it at least some of them, some of the, some of it works in the poems in this book. I mean, the you know the the persona poem, the voice of the person right there in the moment of witness, I think can be very powerful. Right. Um, it's it's really right there. It's not somebody observing from across the street, exactly. um, or across the country, or across the world. You know, um, but you got to be careful. I think. Yeah, yeah. of course. Um, so Kathleen O'Toole asks. Um, Actually, first she says, I was struck by the force and cadence of your language and the way in which King's words inhabited you, but the powerful music that came out and the surprising images are wholly yours. Could you talk about the way your voice and the forms these poems took emerged and, was sh and were shaped in that encounter with his voice? Hmm. Well, Kathleen O'Toole is a fine poet and <laughs> she asked, she's asking a tough question. Thank you, Kathleen. She's asking a tough question. She's um, putting on the spot. Yeah, I, I mean, I guess, you know, I often say to my students, I think that um, poetry is the only, uh, uh, you know, literary form that really, that, that pays serious attention, let's say, to, to sound, and, and sound as in, you know, the words and, and, and rhythm. Um, and um, I write and speak my poems out loud all the time while I'm writing them. Mm. Um, I, 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 I have been, I, I'm a very uh, aural, you know, the A-U-R-A-L, very aural writer. Um, because I think that that's really the, that's the great gift of poems. Um, it, it isn't to say essayists don't ever pay attention to sound or to, or to pace and, and rhythm, good essayists do. But in, in poetry, obviously it's more central. Mm -hmm. um, well, in some ways, it, it, it was a very daunting thing to think about um, going into King's voice. Uh, and what I tried to avoid then was uh, um, trying to do anything with his voice, with his preaching voice. I, I tried never to go, kind of even mm -hmm. to go close to that. Yeah. Um, but to be more like, here's an an event that he's been part of, and we, we and we might all know the event, the Montgomery bus boycott, let's say, or seeing the first bus go by that was empty. Um, it, it, so it's more like Dr. King behind the scene, kind of thinking about the the moment uh, in all of its fullness. And the only time I think I, I went into his voice, uh, public and preaching, is his voice on the last night on the um, on the April third in in Memphis. And we, because we we all know those words, you know, we know the rhythm of that, you know, I've been to the mountain at top, God has let me, let me see the promise land. I may not get there with you, but we as a people will get to the promise land. So what I tried to do there was to let, just use his rhythm, steal the heck out of it, take it all. <laughs> but it's good, but, yeah. But mess up some of the words a little bit. So I, so I just, you know, I'm alive with this terror, you know, I'm, I, where he would say, you know, or I'm, I'm at peace with this terror. I'm alive with this release um, where he would say, uh, uh, you know, I just, um, I'm not fearing any man, you know, he, he, he would say. So there I tried to take his, just let his rhythm be. But I think in the other places, I'm trying more to be like him watching the thing and we're kind of inside his head. And that's what I meant earlier about talking about kind of writing the book I wanted to read, which is, you know, something people talk about a lot these days, um, I wanted I wanted to be inside his head. I wanted to know what he was thinking. You know, mm -hmm. now I don't claim that you know any grand accuracy or you know extraterrestrial wires between his head and mine for sure. Um, 
but if, 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 if you know someone's work and you know their work well, I, or at least I, yeah, I, I, I felt like I was able to do that in a way that I hope the poems come out and feel like they're true. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, if you're, you, if you're sunk really that deep into his work, it's got to it's got to flow out. Very good. Yeah. Um, Diane Connolly uh, writes, um, she quotes you, police said words they would not say to their grandmothers. Uh, and she says, I hear the grandmothers talking to the police. What are they saying, Joseph? The grandmother to the police? Mm. Yeah. Um, she didn't need them. She didn't need their help. You know, the, the help was in the young man who was next to her. Um, what are they saying? <laughs> Some of the grandmothers would, of course, have a lot to say, right? Um, and uh, today we might see more boldness in the grandmothers speaking. We probably, in fact, I'm quite sure we do. Mm -hmm. um, 1955, uh, you know, Montgomery, Alabama, Remember that, you know, those grandmothers would have been nervous about their jobs. They would have been nervous for their hus husband's jobs. They would have been nervous for their children's jobs. Um, and their lives, for that matter. Um, absolutely right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, it's an interesting, it's an interesting question to, to think about. Maybe another, a, a poem that attaches to that one about the, the, the one arrest, that they made one arrest. Mm -hmm. um, and like they had to or something, you know, I mean, right. you know, they, yeah, they, they cooked up rules where they could, you know, if you had, um, you know, you can't have more than three unrelated adults in the same car or you're operating an illegal taxi, you know, of course they cooked up, they threw everything that they could think of. Um, and remember that the bus boycott did not end with, you know, the white power in Montgomery, uh, admitting that, you know, yeah, this is crazy. We gotta, we gotta integrate the buses. It didn't end that way. It ended, they were forced to do it by the US Supreme Court. Right. Um, right. So in some ways, I think the, the nonviolence of the bus boycott and Dr. King even, he thought the word boycott was almost too violent. He referred to it as the bus protest. Okay. Um, yeah, he, huh. did, he did not like the word boycott there. Uh, it's, it's, you know, just land, land, come down to us in our, in our language that that's what it was. But, uh, he wasn't so thrilled with that word, but um, it, it's, it's, it is a kind of a, there's a kind of a cleanliness or like a purity about the nonviolence and the resistance and bringing companies to their knees sort of um, in that, in that kind of a, of a protest where when you got to Albany, Georgia, or a lot of the cities in the North, the kind of racism or the expression of racism was much more, more complex and quiet. And so it was harder uh, you know, like I always tell my, talk to students about nonviolent direct action, Dr. King's idea, the cleanest place to see it is when you see the lunch, the lunch counter protest. It's so easy. You know, there's four stools. The black person puts his body where it is illegal for him to be. The white person attacks. The black person doesn't respond in Dr. King's hope that at some point the white person will stop and say, what am I doing? Why am I doing this? Um, yeah, so it's a, what would the grandmothers say? Yeah. <laughs> um, and I, um, there's lots of um, amens in here, which I love. <laughs> um, the, uh, there's, I think it looks like um, I have a last, a question from Elizabeth Stanley. Um, and I think she's asking you to, to personify King again. What would King say to you today in 2020? Or what would you hope he would say maybe? Uh, yeah, it's an interesting question. And Liz, Liz Stanley is also a fine poet up in Pennsylvania. Um, well, the first thing he would say, I think, today is he, was, he would say Black Lives Matter. And then he would say, vote. Yeah, yeah absolutely. That's a refrain we're going to repeat. Vote. Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, but, you know, I was, I was thinking about the 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 three the pillars, racism, materialism, militarism, they are just as pertinent now as they were then and just as, well, maybe not exactly as prevalent, but really there's, there's still things that we're duking against. Yes. When you're, when you're writing, you, were you trying to center yourself in history? Were you also thinking about today's world as you were writing? 
yeah, you can't, you can't help but do that, you know. Um, and I even I didn't realize until kind of after I had f- thought I was finalized with, um, uh, it's the Coretta, the, the Coretta Scott King poem about daughters and girls mm. that, that Black Lives Matter, that are Black Lives Mean Everything, Black Lives Mean Nothing. I realized, boy, I'm really, I'm, I'm like, I'm using the language of 2020 here, or probably at that point, I'm using the language of 2019 or 2018, mm. almost without knowing it. And then I thought, you know, no, that's fine. That is perfectly fine. Um, it's the, it, uh, you know, it, it is the same, it's the same struggles. I don't, I don't think they've changed much. Um, we, you know, I, we need Dr. King's wisdom and his, you know, how many times, and I tried to repeat it even in the, in the poems I chose for the reading, um, the deep place uh, in his thinking about reconciliation that mm-hmm. we have to walk straight into their arms. Right. You know, the men, the men who left the bomb on my brother's porch, they're ours too. You know, this was never about, Dr. King never wanted to be about winning something over another. It was about reconciling. He always said, we don't want to sit on the, on the bus in front of anybody. We want to ride with everybody. Mm-hmm. It's not about winning. It's about reconciliation. Mm-hmm. That idea by itself is probably about as foreign to American culture today as you know, skipping to the moon. I mean, it's just, we're just, we have a lot of work to do. We have a lot of work to do. And I hope he helped. I know he helps. I hope the poems help. Yeah. Um, we have, uh, we have another question and this one's uh, another anonymous one. It says, uh, you listen deeply and write loud poems. <laughs> um, <laughs> how do you teach students to listen deeply in a way that is an encounter with reality so they can write loudly? Hmm. Well, in all kinds of writing assignments, I think in high, at the, in high school students, at least that I teach, whether it's, and even whether it's in like an, an American literature essay or in creative writing poetry, you know, getting students to write a poem, it's getting them to focus and focus and focus and to write about one thing. Um, mm-hmm. So that, right. you know, they, they always- Concentrate on one, distill yeah. it. Yeah, they always want to go big. Mm-hmm. Um, because that's more, and it, maybe I'll sound smarter, you know, who knows what the, what the motivation is. Um, and I would say, you know, I'd, you know, a, a recent assignment, write, write about a good man, you know, well, can I write about three? No, <laughs> write about one. <laughs> cause I want you to, cause I want you to go deeply. And if you write about three, we're going to be in the shallow end and not the deep end. Mm-hmm. So I think, I mean, focus and, and by focus, I mean, you know, really like narrowing the lens uh, to try to get them to, to just focus on one thing. Mm-hmm. Um, and if that one thing is really, you know, powerful or, you know, a, a, a moment, you know, a, a, a college age kid helping an elderly woman across the street in Montgomery during the bus protest, um, if you can really focus in on that moment, there's the potential there for, in, in the words of the questioner, maybe a loud poem. Because because the power is already in that moment, so don't leave the periphery. You know, like right. laser in on on the core, right. and and no clutter, no clutter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leave the white space around. Yes. Let it speaks loud yep. from the center. Yeah. Um, let's see. I'm looking at the other questions. Um, I'm getting lots of thank yous and votes and tell five people to vote and Black Lives <laughs> Matter and tell five more. Yes. Um, and then, um, oh, this is from Anne Rice. We, um, we need to remember King's voice at this point in our history. We are at a crossroad and we need the wisdom of prophets like King to lead us into a brighter future. And you were just saying the very same thing that if more people listen to King, this world would be so much better. Yeah, and 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 the and um, one of the th- one of the aspects of him, my students always really jump on. They find it like almost a new idea. Is uh, and what I use in the very last poem, uh, the epilogue. Um, his idea of the neutrality of time, that time of itself is just neutral. It just it just ticks along, you know, or the calendar just flips over, you know, it just moves, it's neutral Mm -hmm. until we use it uh, for ways to bring about a more just country or a more just world. Um, I think he probably often thought that um, 
people who were out for ill, you know, people who were, who had, you know, more like white supremacists, they use time quite well. You know, like they're out there doing their thing. They're, they're out there, you know, pushing their ideas and making things happen. Mm -hmm. And often, you know, he talked about one time, Dr. King, about um, somebody wrote him a letter saying, you know, um, we know that the blacks are going to get their right, get their rights at some point. If you just kind of calm and pull back a little bit, it'll be a lot easier. And he was like, how do we know that we will get our rights? Mm -hmm. Like there's nothing, there's time is neutral. There's no magic here or hope is not a strategy. As somebody said, you know, mm -hmm. like yeah. we have to wed work, love to time, crush love into time, um, memory about his life into Wednesdays, you know, into like actual days. Uh, that's, that's our why, that's our revolution. Yeah. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank, thank yeah. you everyone. What a, a great um, honor it was for us to host Joseph Ross tonight. Um, and oh, the honor felt like all of you, all, all, all the viewers. Thank you, Joe. Thank you, thank you everyone who came. It was a great discussion. Um, please look out um, for a follow-up email. Uh, if you'd like to uh, respond to our survey, we'd be happy. And please remember to, um, to go to Joe's site and look for Raising King and buy it, because we all need this to hold close to us. Thanks, everybody. Mm -hmm.